Take it from the top. Hey, folks, man. This is Monk. <laughs> and we're back with another episode of Classes of Cinematics, man. I'm joined, as always, with my host, co-host. We got Bobby Blockbuster. Yo, yo, yo. And this episode is going to be one of our special ones where we're going to be talking about some of the best revenge films and the vigilantes in these films that make them special. You know what I'm saying? So, um, interesting thing, I'm going to start off with one from Steven Seagal, man. And honestly, (laughs) Steven Seagal has an interesting career, but I honestly do think this is probably his best film in his whole filmography. (laughs) And we're going to be talking about Out for Justice from 1991, man. And in this film, he's a police officer who's out for revenge, man, after one of his partners, um... And longtime friends get shot down by the gangster uh, Richie um, in this film, man. And this is what I think makes the film special, man. Seagal is cool, man. He's out for revenge. He's doing his things. But I think The Pursuit of Richie, played by William Forsythe in this film, I don't think there's many films where William Forsythe has eight as he did in this mm-hmm. film, man. He's a crazy gangster, and I think it just drives up the stakes in this thing. He's a mean gangster. He's mean to it, his own guys, you know what I'm saying? Uh, never mind everybody else, man. And I think that's what makes him such a compelling, um, it makes this film compelling to watch, man. Out for justice, man. You know, so Seagal is early in his career, and he's doing his martial arts stuff and his shtick. He's, he's getting, you know, coming of... Um, age so to say in the, in the film world but I think this film is a really great watch man and, and, and it encompasses all the things man because once he um, gets in pursuit you know his, his guy's killed and that guy has a family wife and kids and all that but on the journey to track down Richie he hits the streets man he hits the streets without approval from the other police and you know involved so it's all really straight up vigilante justice and he's knocking on every door trying to you know get to Richie and Richie is, is crazy man like I said the portrayal by Forsyth just takes this thing to the ninth degree man and it's still a really great film man we'll probably get to that one day you know what I'm saying on this show um, mm-hmm. you know what I like best about Steven Seagal's vigilanteism mm-hmm. in this mm-hmm. his vigilante hat <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so that's interesting cause, cause I, he's wearing like this veteran's hat in one of the scenes man you know he's coming about and he you know when he finds out about his guy it almost looks like a, a black um guardian angels um wardrobe instead yeah. of the red vest yeah. and, and the beret that they had he's, yeah. he's in all black man it's crazy but it does take place in new york city so that makes it interesting but but so, so but, but it's great because like i said man he does the, the the it's cliche now but he does the things where he starts targeting richie's businesses and going after his guys to get to the guy on the top and there's some cool stuff in here car chases beat downs and shakedowns ponytails it's going down <laughs> so what you got man all right so uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna start this up man after our we had a we had a, a unique conversation before we started recording and after talking about that i have to talk about this i'm bringing up william d french foster played by michael douglas in none other than 1993's film falling down and what i love about this film is um it feels like an early 1990s version of Grand Theft Auto. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> when, you know, this this, this where humanity and, and and everyday gripes and grievances are just kind of coming to a head for this individual. And he um he's stuck in a traffic jam and everything around him seems to be broken internally, externally. Uh I mean he is uh he is a he is a broken man and it is time for change. And so with that being said he uh, <laughs> once his he can't roll his AC won't work his a his, his window won't roll down he's hot he's sweaty he leaves his car he's like man you know what I'm going home okay he's telling people he's going home and um what's really cool about this is all the pit stops that he makes along the way um the, now how he maneuvers as a vigilante isn't uh, justifiable. Um, to to a T, uh, but it's understandable in a sense um, because when frustration mounts and frustration builds, we will do things that just don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Mm-hmm. But um, he starts off uh, his journey going to a uh, a convenience store, and he doesn't like the fact that everything is overpriced. He needs change for for a phone. The the uh, price of the soda won't give him the correct amount of change for the soda or for the to make the phone call so he starts busting up the merchandise and um you know makes some uh some 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 price changes 
One thing that I did like about <laughs> this particular film is that every time he makes a pit stop and an act of vigilante justice is served, he upgrades his weapons. Okay, <laughs> so he start, he starts getting a baseball bat from the convenience store owner. Then he ends up going to, you know, a hill and uh, he's approached by some gang members who, you know, don't want him there, obviously, because he's not a gang member. So, he, you know, beats him up with the bat, takes the butterfly knife. They try to do a drive by and don't hit him, but hit a bunch of innocent bystanders. <laughs> and I, I like that they showed that because that just also shows how sense, senseless violence can be um, if you are going to try to take someone out make sure you have your target in your scope um it, it, you know innocent bystanders should not be getting taken out over something so frivolous nobody should but you know if you're gonna aim aim right and um you know from that he ends up acquiring a bag full of guns and then it just goes downhill from there like he he goes into uh, uh what would be our version of a, a fast food restaurant you, you fill in the blank okay um but in the movie it's a whammy burger and we've all been there before where you show up two minutes late you want a breakfast sandwich breakfast mm -hmm. is over and he pulls out a what is it? it looks like a tech nine <laughs> and starts spraying up the ceiling and then decides that you know what i will eat the the regular food um so it shows how indecisive he is with with what he's doing like it, it, he's he's so emotionally based and emotionally driven by his want for change that makes it unjustifiable you know what i'm saying most of the time when you get your vigilantes they um they have a clear understanding of what they're doing why they're doing doing it the reasoning behind it whereas him it's just you know with each situation how does it make me feel at that moment Mm -hmm. And, you know, then he, uh, you know, as he as he progressively moves forward, just creating a tirade through his city, um, you know, cross paths with construction workers that are doing, you know, meaningless work just to keep up the budget, blows a rocket launcher at somebody and um, saying all that to say this, you know, every good vigilante has a good cop on their heels and he is no different. You know, when the cop finally gets to him gets him to the point where he's like look man everything that you're doing is wrong and you know you're gonna have to pay pay the piper for this you know what i'm saying your gripes and grievances have been heard but you still ain't get ahead with this one yeah. what, what i like about him i feel like his the stuff he's doing in this film is is a, things that we wish we all could do they're they're mm -hmm. they're, they're everyday modern minor inconveniences you know and he's kind of you know, taking the place of the viewers and a lot of the situations, you know, so it's just crazy, man. It's mm -hmm. an interesting look, uh, take. Um, so my next guy is going to be, um, Ogami Ito, and this is going to be from the film Shogun Assassins from 1980. And this is an interesting film here. Um, the setup to this, uh, it's actually a film that's comprised, you know, that was released to a broader American and worldwide audiences. So it's two films from this series combined into one. But we're introduced to this character, pretty much the lone wolf and cub character. Mm -hmm. It's based off a manga that, that was around for a long time. And in uh, the story, um, interesting <laughs> thing about it is he's a character that is the assassin for a shogun in this realm, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. so what ends up happening, the shogun has a lot of enemies. He's, he's lording over this empire, but he doesn't trust anyone. And that even extends to his executioner. And, and that becomes a problem. So, so because he doesn't trust his executioner, he thinks he's going to um, turn on him. He sends assassins to take him out, but he's not there. Um, the only one there is um, his uh, wife and the kid. And they actually kill his wife. So, you know, he grabs his kid and goes on a mission of revenge, man. You know what I'm saying? Ends up killing the uh, the Shogun's brother in the mix. <laughs> in the mix of this because, because uh, you know, since he survived, the, the, the Shogun put out a decree, bring this guy in. And he offers him a chance. Like, if you could beat my brother, you know, your debt's clear. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And he actually beats the brother. And the Shogun sends another messenger that says, all right, since you beat my brother, your debt is clear. But we've got to take your son um, just for an example. And he's not trying to give up his son. And then he just goes on the run. He grabs his son, takes out these dudes. It's, it's, this movie is amazing on a revenge standpoint because ultimately... 
you know, his quest is to get to the Shogun, but he's going on a roundabout way, you know, and, and also there's moments where he's, it's, it's not a direct path. It's not like he's going straight to the Shogun. He's out there and out in the world just gathering himself, kind of minding his business, you know, waiting for the perfect time to strike. But in the meantime, the Shogun has all these people are coming after him, all the Shogun's killers, his ninjas and all that stuff. And they assault this man. They stop him. They try to track him down along his way. And what's interesting, he's got the baby with him the whole time. He looks like a three-year-old. And he's got a cart. He pushes him in a cart. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and dude, but this film is so crazy. It's blood-soaked. It has inspired so many revenge films, including Kill Bill. There's parts of this that are adapted from this. One of my favorite moments in pop culture history is there's an episode of Samurai Jack where Samurai Jack is just chilling. And he runs into the lone wolf and cub, like, and they just oh, wow. pass each other. It's, it's one of the craziest cameos you'll ever see. But, but, but coming back to this thing, man, yo, this Shogun, the Shogun's assassin, uh, um, Ito in this movie, yo, he's not playing around, bro. This guy's the best at what he does, and what he does isn't very nice, you know, to quote Wolverine. But the final battle here in this revenge flick that I think is dope is him in the desert at the very end. And he takes out a whole army, dude. It's just him and his cart with this kid in it. But this cart is crazy. The cart like got the weapons in it. Yo, the cart got weapons in it, bro. It's crazy, <laughs> man. Like, and he, he, yo, he takes out a, a small squad, <laughs> yo, by himself. Him and his kid and his cart. There's blades that come out the wheels. He's cutting ankles off. Like, like it, it's, it's just crazy to me, man. Whoa. It's just... Every, it's just a wild story, bro. <laughs> every good vigilante has to be prepared. Yeah, man, this this thing is crazy, man. I definitely highly recommend the Shogun's Assassin. One of the top revenge films. And this guy is is definitely like when I look at a vigilante, I look at people who have been greatly wronged and, and they're trying to set it right in their own way outside of the normal you of know the law. Yeah, outside of the laws of the land. And, yeah. and especially when the laws of the land aren't you know, um, holding you down. They're not giving you your own personal justice, you know, I think. Yeah. And I think that's what's going on with this thing, man. Really, really go. beautiful film, man. Beautiful. Great series. Beautiful, beautiful. Speaking of beautiful, oh, I'm going to segue this one into my next vigilante, which is Coffee, played by Pam Greer from 1973's Coffee. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Um, she... <laughs> She is just she's an amazing vig vigilante. Um, I can talk about Pam Greer all day long, um, but I'm just going to keep it brief uh, and keep it focused. So she is a nurse by trade and ass kicker by choice, man. <laughs> fed up, fed up with the corruption in the world. She's determined to take a stand, especially when it hits home, when her younger sister almost dies from a drug overdose. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then... um. What makes it worse? Yeah, imagine if Pookie had a sister. Yeah, that, that, that and then what makes what makes it worse is you know she talks to a police officer friend of hers, and um, they they go back to the house to chill out for a little bit, and uh, two goons beat the crap out of him because he don't want to become a dirty cop, and you know uh, it, it just it, it it shows that you know there is just this, this corruption all over. She then later finds out that her congressman boyfriend is also crooked. I mean there is just so much going on in this young lady's life so she decides that all the pimps pushers even the prostitutes got to go we got it we got to tighten this thing up we got we got to make sure that you know that that everything everything that uh that, that you know that is going wrong needs to get righted and you know the thing is is that she has like a, a smooth and 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 like subtle way of and, uh, you know, definitely a lot of sex appeal. So she's able to kind of like integrate herself into these situations mm -hmm. almost seamlessly. Um, she doesn't wear a costume, not like a Batman, but she maneuvers in the, in the same way where, you know, she can kind of go undercover and, and be involved in these situations. And then once her, her target is set, that's where she strikes. And I mean, mm -hmm. once she locked in, dog, I mean, she take you out with shotgun with a wig full of razor blades <laughs> with a kung fu kick i mean she's just she is relentless with her approach um but the thing is is that she is just she is driven by the fact that something needs to give something needs to change and that nobody is doing anything about it and you know so she 
mm-hmm. is willing to take a stand. And I mean, and that in itself makes her stand above a lot of the uh, the other you know vigilantes. You know that that you know we we talk about and with her being a female. It just makes it that yeah. that much harder. Uh, you can definitely see this influence Kill Bill in, 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 to a degree, man. But also, it's funny to me because I think her vigilantism, she, she's getting a lot of collateral, bro. Like, like some of these Hell folks yeah. were not directly involved in her brother's death, but they getting it too, man. And that's kind of funny to me. Yes. <laughs> and she, like I said, she is just seamlessly able to maneuver in her acts because she is just gorgeous. So people, <laughs> people lose sight yeah. of what's going on. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, coffee's crazy, man. Um, so my next one, the final one I'm going to talk about, I'm going to be talking about Peyton Westlake in the film Dark Man. And I believe, what year was this? 1990? 1990. Um, I remember seeing this in the theater uh, as well. Yeah, 1990, uh, Sam Raimi film, um, you know, uh, Evil Dead. Uh, Spider-Man 2 uh, fame. Uh, this film stars Liam Neeson. In this um, film, um, thugs employed by a crime boss, they assault Dr. Peyton Wilder, played by Neeson, um, leaving him um, psychologically, physically scarred, and they destroy his research and pretty much his life, man. So he becomes horribly disfigured. Um, his hands are scarred. His face is scarred. But what he was working on was um, technology for burn victims. And his aim was to uh, uh, kind of give them, you know, a way to um, cover up their burns or give them a second skin kind of thing. And, um, you know, it goes from there. So upon recovery, he decides to get revenge against his crime boss. Because like I said, his life is done, man. He, yeah. he, he ends up living like in the sewers. He rebuilds his lab and goes back into his research. And this allows him to create um, this temporary skin. He has a problem. It only lasts 99 minutes, man. But also... During the recovery from the the accident, when they try to burn his lab, he's horribly burned and scarred. But the doctors did this um, procedure to stop his pain, pretty much severed his nerves. So he doesn't feel no pain, which kind of gives him, in a way, almost superhuman um, strength and stuff. Because he's not feeling the physical things that will hold us back physically. He doesn't feel any of that, man. You know, you can shoot him, you can stab him. As long as you don't hit nothing vital, he's going to keep coming at you. Ain't no ouching going on. Yeah, and he, <laughs> so, so essentially he becomes Batman, and I think what's cool about this film, it's really, it's honestly, it's a comic book type film. He's pretty much Batman, and but he's using um, his technology. He's able to do the skin, but he's got 99 minutes, so, so what's cool about it is he can um, imitate some of uh, what's my man's name, uh, Robert G. Durant, yo, uh, yo, Dude, Dr. Got, Dr. Giggles, yo, Dr. Giggles, <laughs> man. Shout out to him, man. This is another, yes. this is another one where I think the, the villain makes this play by yes. um, uh, Larry Drake, rest in peace. And he's so good as a bad guy in this he book. Is. But he's using these faces and disguises because, like I said, he can imitate these guys' faces. But he's got 99 minutes, so he's doing this thing where he's kind of like the movie Fresh, where he's playing everyone against each other yes. to get closer to Durant, Durant, destroy his little gang, and finally, you know, get in there and go for his final strike. But it's a cool film. It's an interesting revenge thing because I think um, it's clever how they use his... They took everything from him, you know. It's almost it's. It would have been better if they killed him, you know. They left him with nothing. His his his, his love interest, you know. He's scared to, for her to see him how he looks now with the terrible disfiguration, and and he uses that to fuel him. It becomes yes. a rage. At first, he's really sad for himself, but then it becomes a rage that fuels him in his pursuit for revenge. You know what I really like about this is it kind of hits to me almost like watching the invisible man be a superhero mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying like mm-hmm. even when he's when he's wrapped up with all the ace bandages <laughs> on his face or the ability to to change his face or even with when he has a face on it only lasts for a certain amount of time mm-hmm. the way he maneuvers i was like man this is like this is like the invisible man conceptually but just taking a like you said like a comic book approach very very cool very very well done and well structured film but definitely mm-hmm. one of my personal favorites from my uh, yeah, early yeah. childhood <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yes, yes. So I'm going to go ahead and close this thing out with none other than Eric Draven from 1994's The Crow. And this is personally one of my favorite vigilante films. It's, um, it's structure, it's dynamic, it's concept. Uh, everything is just, uh, it's, it's, 
it's beautiful chaos. It's destruction. It's heartfelt, and it's uh, it's man. It's just it's it's love and hate all wrapped up in one, you know. And um, the thing, uh, so so pretty much it it it, it takes place after a brutal a brutal course of events that happens to Eric Draven and his fiance. The both of them, you know, die with a lot of pain and scar tissue. Eric and Eric Draven is resurrected um, due to this. Uh, to be able to seek vengeance on those that not only harmed him, but more so harmed Shelly, his, uh, his fiance. And, you know, the fact that he is driven by hatred, but powered by love is what makes this vigilante so impactful to me because I never really saw anything done like this in this fashion up until this movie you know what i'm saying i'm not to say other movies like this haven't been made but i ain't seen one nah, this thing was definitely you know the style of this thing is, is top notch man it's definitely yes. has it has his own look and feel man and and so you know and the thing is is that you know when he does resurface and reemerge, it is just it is amazing to watch him manifest and become what he will now be in his new purpose driven you know well, it's not a life uh, existence on on the earth until his job is completed. Um, I mean, he, he goes back to the home. You see, you're seeing all these flashbacks. I mean, he puts on you know his uh, his all black. The face paint montage is really dope. And then when he starts seeking out the individuals, I mean, he is methodically taking them out one by one. But what I really appreciated about it is that they all are you know very uniquely. Um, killers by certain ways you know like the guy Tintin he liked to throw knives so so, so yeah so, so so he you know so what he did is he 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 stabs them up in his organs in alphabetical order from what they say you know or fun boy was a drug addict so he you know he OD'd him up you know what I'm saying um T-Bird was one yeah wanted, wanted to blow up buildings and everything so he trunk full of firecrackers tapes him up you know to the driver's seat of the car blows up his car you know he's very he's meticulous he's methodical he's well thought out but he is relentless with his pursuit of taking out everyone who harmed his Shelly you know and, and he will stop at nothing he has nothing to lose everything that he had to lose has already been lost yeah, you know yeah, what I mean yeah. so what do you do when somebody like that is on your back you know what I'm saying you, you can fold but you're still gonna die or you can fight and you're still gonna die yeah it's interesting how this story even came about because like I think the real life the author of uh, was it James Obar mm -hmm. is is his Love of his life, of um, died from a drunk, drunk driver. driver. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and it's interesting because when that something like that happens, there is no revenge. You just got to eat that. There's yeah. no one to really blame. You know, yeah, that driver, but it's also just a freak accident. Like, like you, what can you do? And I think it's interesting that this story came out of that. It came out of him trying to channel that disappointment, that anger, and we get this story. You know what I'm saying? And and, and like I said, man. Um, the stylization of it, like I think it was unique when it came out and, and, and rapping this thing in that grunge rock scene that was kind of, you know, kind of, you know, in its infancy and, and just spreading. Because I remember when this thing hit in that soundtrack and them songs, was, yes. this was back in yes. the day when MTV was showing music in the morning and stuff from that soundtrack. I'll be getting dressed and this shit's on my TV, yeah. going to school. Yeah. And like, and the, the sound, the music, the, the look, of, like, the it's look almost of it. like this. This neo gothic look to what's going on here, yes. man. It's crazy, yes. man. Like this is this is one of my favorites, definitely. This is yes. one of my favorite films, films ever in dude. general. I mean, it, yeah. it it hits on every key note, but mm -hmm. you know, just to, to to keep it when it comes to the realm of revenge, you know, the motivation behind it is just it's spine tingling, it's chilling, and it's relatable. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And like you said, this is this derived from a story of a man who lost his life to a trap. Uh, lost his wife to a tragic accident mm -hmm. but what he did with this story is he gave yeah. his his vigilante a target base mm -hmm. so so and, and so he could take his aggressions out yeah and there was no justice for him you know like like the authorities were there on the payroll so no one really looked into this it was just like oh it was just 
It was a freak accident. It was a fire. And they died. You know, it. even though we know it was way worse than that, yeah, man. man. Definitely a good pick, man. But I think we out of here, folks, man. We're going to catch y'all soon for the next list, man. Make sure you click um, below for the links. Uh, you know, support us. You know, if you want to buy some gear. We also got the QR code on the screen. You can scan that on your phone. It'll take you right to the uh, Classes of Cinematics merch page. But follow us on Instagram, and you can follow me at Monkey Blood on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah, man, we're fancy now. We got the thing <laughs> that you use your phone and do the, the 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 thing with, man. So you know, apply the fanciness. It's there for a reason. <laughs> this is Bobby Blockbuster. You can catch me on this show or the film review show. Thanks for the love and support, always. All right, peace. <laughs>